Hi, everybody. I'm Steve, as you just heard. Um, I guess I don't need to introduce myself, because I just got a great introduction. So let's get right into it. Um, my talk today is called The Past, Present, and Future of the Web. And so um, we're going to talk about the history of the web a little bit first, and then talk about this idea of the web as a platform. And then finally, where is it going in the future? And spoiler alert, it's WebAssembly. So this is kind of a little bit of a WebAssembly talk and kind of a little bit of a talk about the history um, of how the web has worked. But before we get into that, it's important that I put this slide up here because this... <laughs> So this is now like six or seven layers of inception we counted, so I didn't want to be left out. I don't have anything clever to say, it's just, I like memes, so I want to be part of them. All right, so first chunk, we're going to talk about a short history of the web. Um, like many of you, I'm sure, uh, came to the web after it was originally invented, and so I think learning about the history of things is really important. You can't understand where you are unless you know where you came from, and you can't understand where you're going unless you know where you are and where you came from. So um, I think this matters. So in the beginning, there was HTML, and it was good. It was also a little bad, but it is also good. Um, you know, we could actually start even beginning before here. Like, the tricky part about history is that it goes for, like, thousands of years. So, like, I could have said in the beginning there was SGML, right? And then HTML came from that, and then the stuff before it. But you have to pick somewhere. So today we're starting with HTML. The first website using HTML, of course, went live on August 6th of 1991. That's a really long time ago. Um, I don't have a screenshot from those days exactly, but this is roughly what uh, that website would look like today because it turns out browsers are great at backwards compatibility, and so if you go visit that website, you get pretty much the original thing. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff up here, like what is this? Help, technical details, the people, and some history, all these kinds of things. And it says, the World Wide Web, all one word with three capital W's, Parentheses W3. I mean, we don't really call it W3 today, but they thought, you know, back then that would be, is a wide area hypermedia information retrieval initiative. So branding maybe needs a little work, but it's the first release. So, you know, you got uh, to give them some credit. And this was, you know, the, the internet had been around for a long time, relatively speaking, um, but the web was this new, interesting hypermedia thing. This is a screenshot of one of my favorite emails that's ever been sent. This is by a man named Mark Andreessen. You may have heard of him from his shenanigans he's up to today, but back in the day, he was involved in working on the web platform. And this is an email sent in February of 1993 that says, hey, I'd like to propose a new addition to HTML. We should be able to display images. So here's my proposal for the IMG tag. And it's got one argument. SRC equals URL. Here's how it's going to work. Uh, oh, all right. Uh, I guess I'll just talk. Oh, I came back. Cool. <laughs> so this works by uh, you know, taking a bitmap file, because like, we didn't have a zillion image formats yet. Uh, and the browser will attempt to pull it down over the network and interpret it as an image to be embedded in the page where the tag happens. So, right, these are like the early days. Like, we didn't even have images. We had to, like, think about how they worked. Um, and I think this is important because, like, that's how we do stuff today, but it's easy to sort of lose track of the fact that, you know, there was a time before images were available on the web. Like, this email was sent in 93. This web page went up in 91, right? So there was a good solid two and a half, two, three years. Uh, my talk is so powerful that I'm making the power go out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so there's like multiple years where we had web pages with no possibility of an image, right? So that's kind of like interesting to think about. Um, then uh, the next year, um, there's a bunch of names in this talk, and I never looked up how to properly pronounce them. So I'm going to have them on the screen. I'm just not going to say them because a lot of people mess up my last name, and it sucks. So I'm just going to like, you can read their names. Um, so CSS was first proposed in 1994. So that's one of the reasons why that website still looks the same today as it did back then, because there was just no CSS, right? So it's just the default way that HTML renders. But this was a year after that. So we had three years between 
HTML, like the first web page existing and the ability to style it at all, and one year of the ability of putting images in web pages without the ability to style those web pages. So the web was a very different place back in those days. JavaScript famously created in a very short period of time in 1995. So again, one year later, uh, you know, four years after the first web page went out, we had JavaScript. Um, and so kind of my point is, is that the core technologies that we use to build web applications and websites were sort of mostly made up like 23 years ago, which is sort of an eternity in computer time. Um, and you know, these sort of three pillars of the web, they've changed a lot, right? Like, <laughs> obviously, a lot of the talks at this conference are about like, the new fancy thing that we've added to JavaScript or you know, the way that you can use CSS in a way you never used it before. But like, the fundamental ideas about how we build things on the web has pretty much remained unchanged for 23 years. Now, originally, websites were all static in the terms we use today. There were HTML files, and you downloaded them. Um, there was this program called Mod Perl, and uh, it was released in 1996. And Mod Perl is named so because there's a programming language called Perl that you may have heard of. Um, and Apache was a very prominent web server at the time. And you would be able to write extensions for Apache, and they were called modules. So extensions to Apache all started with mod underscore in the name of the extension. And this was how you would build sort of like a more complicated website. You would write an extension to Apache to do the thing that you wanted it to do. Um, and so somebody came up with the idea, why don't I write an extension where I can have a programming language generate the HTML instead of just writing the HTML in a file? And so this was like a pretty huge step forward in terms of being able to build dynamic things um, on the web. So that was 96. So five years of sort of no dynamic, real dynamic capacity at all. Um, and so the way that these things interacted with each other is through this thing called CGI, or the Common Gateway Interface. And it was proposed in 93. They didn't actually standardize it until 2004, but it was pretty much standard in the sense that it didn't really change very much. It's just nobody went through the motions of actually standardizing it. But CGI, there was then a mod CGI, similar to mod Perl, that said, hey, if we're going to make programming languages be able to run things to generate web pages, maybe we should make a standard interface for people to be able to do these things. Um, and so even our, our like, current model of have a program generate a web page still goes back like almost 20 years. And so a lot of stuff has happened in those 20 years, but mostly it's been refinement of those original ideas rather than like a total th throw out and rethink of everything. And there's definitely a lot of people over the years who have wanted to sort of throw out and redesign the web, and most of those efforts have failed, including the efforts by the people who originally made the web in the first place. Like, how many people know Project Xanadu? Yeah, OK, that's what I thought. Like, three people. Um, Ted Nelson. I don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so historically speaking, we've been in this mode of refinement rather than throwing everything out. And I think that's fundamentally a good thing. Um, and this is also, you know, like all generalizations are false. Like there has been some significant changes in this period of time. Um, and some of that is this sort of rediscovery of JavaScript. And I'll, I'll get back into what I mean by that a little bit later in the talk. Um, but it's not like there's been no sort of major changes, but like the foundations are pretty much the same. OK, that's enough of the history for now. Let's talk about this idea of the web platform. Um, I work at Mozilla, and whenever I started at Mozilla, um, people started talking about like the platform team and kept saying things like the web platform. And I was like, I have no idea what they mean by the web platform. And I think that's because it's sort of a little misnamed or maybe a better way to understand of it would be to think about it as the web application platform. And sort of what we mean by that is that uh, you know, the word platform has kind of gotten corrupted by startups to some degree into being almost meaningless anyway. But like the web browser provides a platform for you to build your applications on top of. And so it's sort of like the fundamental like, substrate of the way that you build applications on the web. 
Um, and so, you know, in some ways it's kind of a fancy name for like a web browser, but that's also sort of not true exactly. Um, so since that word platform has kind of gotten a little messed up, um, I'm going to give you my own personal definition that I'm going to use for the rest of this talk. And, uh, you know, we'll just throw another definition on the pile and it's fine. Um, but when I think about the fundamental ideas of what a platform is, and by that I mean software that you use to build other software on top of, it sort of has these three major components. The first one is an ISA, or an instruction set architecture. And this is kind of like what the code can actually do. Like what are the instructions that you can give to the underlying system to make it do different stuff? Um, the second one is some sort of runtime environment and the API that it provides. Um, and the difference between these two things is sort of like, you can think of the ISA as like the language of uh, you know, what you're trying to say, and the runtime environment is the specific words that are recognizable in that language. So for example, and, and, well, I'll get into some re other examples later, but like for this slide, um, like an ISA is like the JavaScript language, and the runtime environment is like the functions that are provided by default, which are pretty small in JavaScript. Um, but are bigger and many other things. And the final part that's important about a platform is tools. And that's because if you're going to build something on top of a platform, you generally want a nice way to build stuff on top of that platform. And so you need some sort of tools to help you build these things. So these three components are the sort of the fundamental components of a platform as far as I'm concerned. So let's talk about two examples before we talk about the web of tr more traditional platforms when people talk about. So case study. Java, that language that JavaScript was named after for marketing reasons, but has nothing to do with JavaScript, really. Um, its instruction set is Java bytecode. And that is, the Java virtual machine has this bytecode that executes. And that's sort of the fundamental way that you interact with the JVM, um, which is the runtime. And uh, notice I said Java bytecode and not Java, the programming language, because as a platform, Java supports more than just the language Java, right? You can write Scala, and it will compile to the JVM. Um, and what that means is it compiles to Java bytecode, and then it runs inside of the JVM's runtime environment. Um, so that's kind of like the little bit of separation there. And then finally, the tool is Java C. Almost nobody, except for like AFER, Kyle Kingsbury, uh, writes Java bytecode by hand. Um, most people have a programming language, and they run the Java compiler or the Scala compiler or the whatever compiler, and that produces the bytecode for you, right? So that tool is what helps you build applications on top of that platform. Here's one that's a little more unusual. I picked this one first because I think people are used to thinking about Java as a platform, but your operating system and your computer's hardware are also a platform in this definition. So if we pick the x86 architecture, when you think about Unix running on the x86 architecture, the instruction set is x86 assembly language. That's fundamentally how you can communicate with the hardware. Um, and the runtime is Unix itself. When we talk about runtimes, we're used to thinking about a programming runtime or like a virtual machine. But your operating system is kind of like a virtual machine for all the programs that run on your computer. Right? Like we don't write programs for every specific kind of CPU. We write them for an operating system. And that operating system provides the same abstractions over the hardware as our virtual machines provide over the particular code that you implement in it. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a shift to the way that most people think about these kind of things. But it's still fundamentally, like architecturally, the same idea. And then tooling, you know, classically in Unix, we have a shell. We have the C programming language, and we have GCC to compile it. So all these same kind of things. You can build stuff for Unix. And lots of people talk about things being Unix-y. Like you know, when Ryan introduced Node into the world, he was like, I want it to be you know, Unix-like. So that's a slightly different platform. So what happens when we think about the web in this sort of terms? Well, here's the thing. Most of the time, I put it in one, two, three order, because usually those things are developed in that order. So first, you develop the instruction set. So like, I'm building a CPU. What assembly instructions does it support? And then on top of that, you layer the runtime that you want. Like, here is the execution environment. And then finally, you give people the tools. So most of the time, you go one, two, three. But the web platform is really weird. <laughs> and what I mean by being really weird is that it was not developed in that order, which is kind of the way that almost every other platform has been developed. And it's also historically been missing chunks of this kind of like ontology of platforms. So let's talk a little bit about how that works. Um, 
Before we do, I forgot I have one more slide. Uh, one other way in which the web platform is weird is like most platforms, you build something for your local machine first, and then you add in networking capability. So like thinking about the JVM, you know, you run programs locally, and then there's an HTTP library that you use to communicate out to something else. So, so programs are like local, and then they're networked. But on the web, almost all applications have been networked to start, right? Because like the client-server model is sort of fundamental to the way that we build things on the web. And only now are we starting to be able to make local things. If you look at like the offline first movement in JavaScript, for example, you, know, you have people that are talking about offline web apps, which at first feels like a contradiction. And it feels like one because we started off with online first. So this is one way in which the web is like totally backwards from most other platforms. And that's, that's had a really interesting aspect on how it's developed. And so, yeah, in that client-server model, the browser is kind of like a view into an application that's running on the server, right? So you think about that mod Perl example. The Perl code is not running on your computer. It's running on a server somewhere. And you just kind of get to like, look at it from afar. Um, and that's the way that things worked for a really long time. And so the problem with this architecture, and I mean, it's, it's not inherently a problem. Like, I love the web. I've been doing stuff with the web for like a really long time. I think there's a fantastic architecture. But the way that that's developed has limited the kind of stuff that we can build. When I talked about it feeling weird that you can build offline web apps, that's what I mean. Like, it seems like there should be no way to build a web application that does not have access to the internet. Um, and so that kind of limits the things that we can build, but more importantly, it limits the way that we think about the web. Because if you want to build something, the first thing that you need to do is imagine that it's possible. Like, n everything to build Node.js could have been done in 1995, when JavaScript was invented. There's no technical limitation on that. It took Ryan imagining the possibility of making server-side things in JavaScript to be able to build it. And so I think it's really important to not just think about like, the limitation in a technical sense, but like imagination. And limiting our imagination can be really harmful to making progress and like, building new cool stuff. So <clears throat> that's kind of like where we're at today. And so what I want to talk about now is sort of where the web platform is kind of going. Um, and I want to preface this with there's sort of like two paths that this all could take. Uh, they're sort of keeping along the current path. And then there's the one I'm about to tell you about. So it's not totally sure that this wall will come to pass, but this is like the future that I am working on. And when I like, uh, I'm part of the community group to develop WebAssembly, and I like work on WebAssembly stuff. And part of the reason why is this is kind of the future that I believe in, but not everyone believes in it. So I'm here to like convince you this is a good idea so that we can all do it together. So I'm sort of more presenting ideas than I am promises. Um, and I'll try to be a little clear about those specifics as we go through the rest of this. Um, so further developing the web as a platform and giving it more capabilities so we can build more interesting and different applications requires filling in those missing pieces that we haven't had before. And I think I keep coming back to the offline example because I think it's just a great example of the stuff that was missing on the web today. And you know, we've been working on that for a while now, and that stuff is kind of like going forward. Um, but we need to sort of fill in these gaps. So let's use my little one, two, three on the web. Number one, the instruction set. You could argue that this is JavaScript, but I think that that's not a good argument. I'll get into that in a second. Um, the second one is the runtime. And in this case, that's the combination of JavaScript and then also the other APIs that a browser gives you access to, like the DOM, for example. Um, and as far as tooling on the web, I think that you all know that we have like, no shortage of tools to build stuff. Um, about an hour ago, I learned that somebody wrote a new web JavaScript bundler in Rust to like, compete with Parcel, basically. So it's like time until a new bundler came out is like reset the clock. It's been, it's been one hour since the last one came out. Um, we got so many tools, and it's really awesome. And I love that we have so many different ways of building things. It's really great. And I also think it's one of the reasons the web has been successful. If you only have one tool, then it can lead to stagnation and a lack of imagination. But we have so many tools that we can do all kinds of really cool things. Um, so let's talk about why JavaScript does not fit in as an instruction set architecture. It, it kind of does, but it's also kind of not. And a primary reason for this is that JavaScript was not designed for this task. Um, 
What's kind of funny is this sentence is just true no matter what task you're like talking about really, right? Like whatever you're doing, it's like it was never actually designed to do this, um, which is fine. Like it's still been successful because it's great regardless of that aspect. And so if you wanted to think about JavaScript as being the instruction set for the web, then you'd primarily be thinking about compile to JavaScript. The same way we compile a native program into assembly language, you'd be compiling something into JavaScript. And that does obviously work. Uh, many people have been building stuff in languages that compile to JavaScript. There's a ton of really cool languages that compile to JavaScript. But it also has significant drawbacks as an instruction set architecture. Um, one of the biggest problems with it as an ISA is there's a significant amount of overhead. So because JavaScript is like a, a real quote unquote programming language instead of just an assembly language, that means that when we want to execute JavaScript, we have to first download it from the server, and then we have to parse all that JavaScript. And then because of the, through the wonders of like JITs, it actually does get compiled. Um, you know, even though we don't think about JavaScript as a compiled language, that's sort of because the word compiled has gotten way more complicated over the last 15 years. Um, and then finally executed. So these steps all generally need to happen, but JavaScript has a lot of overhead in these areas compared to other examples. So for example, um, a real programming language is significantly harder to parse than a binary format, for example. Um, and it's also much larger than a binary format would be, which means that it takes longer to download because the file sizes are bigger. So it does work. It's just not ideal. Um, JavaScript also has no integers. It turns out computers really like integers. Like floating points are actually kind of hard. And today's JavaScript basically only has floating point numbers. That's sort of going away. There's a proposal in TC39 for big integers. But even big integers are not like appropriate for many use cases. Uh, for a lot of stuff, you want to know how big an integer is and what happens when you like multiply them together and all that kind of thing. And this last one is like total bullshit, and I admit that up front but it's sort of a proxy for complexity. The current version, and by current I mean I think ES 2016, maybe 2017, I forget which one because it doesn't matter that much because this is kind of a dumb example, is 885 pages long. And obviously page length doesn't really matter. Like if you write really flowing prose, it's going to take a lot longer than something shorter. But like the JavaScript spec is big. Most programming languages specs are big. And that means they're complicated and they're hard to implement. Like, there are only so many organizations that can actually build a full JavaScript engine that executes like production-ready speeds today. Um, there are definitely smaller hobby ones, but it's like it's not simple. It's very complicated. It's not a bad thing. It's just the truth. I work on a programming language. We don't have a spec yet. If we had a spec, it'd probably be larger than that. Like, it's not it's not a bad thing uh, always. So. I bet that I've done enough leading up to this that you probably know the answer by now. But I'm arguing that WebAssembly is what fits into that slot number one. WebAssembly is replacing this significant thing that we've been missing on the web. And that's a low-level way of writing stuff um, on the web platform. And so if we have you know, this stuff, we've sort of filled out this significant gap that we've been missing. The WebAssembly spec I love like really deeply. Like, I, I'm a kind of a spec nerd in general. Like I'm a person who likes to read specifications. Um, the WebAssembly spec is one of the most like beautiful specs I've ever read. You should like go home and like check it out sometime. They uh, they have a full parallel. Like here's the math definition and here's the words definition. And if there's a discrepancy between the two, that's a bug. Like they want it to be accessible um, and it's really accessible and it's also very small. So it's 165 pages, which again is made up, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, just know that it comes with those limitations. And, and that kind of like smallness is a proxy for so many other things about WebAssembly and why it, it does a better job at JavaScript at fitting into this slot number one. You also notice, and I'll repeat this again later, WebAssembly does not replace JavaScript. It's for slot number one, and JavaScript is for slot number two. So I'm not arguing that you should stop doing JavaScript and start using WebAssembly. Some people say that, and those people are wrong. Like, it's just not true. Um, Okay, and so like, what does this give us? Like, why do we care about having an ISA for the web? And that's because like previously, the web is mostly focused on high-level tasks, but we want to be able to do more low-level stuff on the web too. And so I've definitely said this to people before, and they're like, "What do you mean by low-level tasks?" Um, there's a lot of stuff. 
Like, all the things that you don't think of as traditionally being for the web, um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is not low-level stuff. So one example I like to use a lot, and this ties back to the whole integers thing, one thing that really needs integers is cryptography. Like, you can't use floats in a lot of crypto because that's just asking for problems. Um, and so crypto on the web sort of works if you write your JavaScript in a way that you know that V8 will optimize it into an integer, but like trusting the security of your platform to like compiler optimizations that may change over time is just like not nearly as good as being like, I would like this integer, I would like to multiply it with this other integer. Um, and so that's one example of a low-level task. I'll talk a little bit more about other ones shortly. Um, but because we don't have the ability to do some things on the web, and because we're slowly adding these things, the web platform is like closing in on these different application domains that we couldn't previously do. And WebAssembly is one part of that story. There's also a lot of other stuff that's um, accessible to JavaScript that we're writing today. But I think that in the future, some of these features of the platform will be sort of WebAssembly only and not JavaScript only. Um, a good example of this today is SIMD for single instruction, multiple data. It's a way of doing calculations really, really fast. There was originally SIMDJS, and they were talking about putting it in, the, in the, script, the standard for JavaScript. But then WebAssembly came along, and the current thinking, as I understand it, which may be wrong, is that SIMD will appear in WebAssembly but not in JavaScript. And if you want to do SIMD stuff, you should call into the WebAssembly from your JavaScript. Um, and so heavy computation is one of those um, areas that we can do on the web we couldn't do before. Um, before I go a lot further, um, a lot of people who've been around the block on the web for a while see WebAssembly and they're like, I remember Java applets. Um, <laughs> when I went to university, half of my web development class was writing Java applets, and the other half was memorizing the PHP standard library. Uh, my professor told me the only difference between get and post is that post puts things not in the URL and get puts things in the URL. And I mean things. He didn't even say parameters. He said things are in the URL. Um, there were other attempts at doing stuff like this too, like Flash, for example. And there was also NACL and PC NACL. Um, but it's not actually the same. Um, and it's totally reasonable to assume that they're the same thing at first. But there's a number of reasons why it's different this time. Um, the first one is there's only one virtual machine. So WebAssembly was designed in such a way that you can sort of like add a small component to your existing JavaScript VM and have it execute WebAssembly. So you don't need like, OK, we have one big runtime here that's for JavaScript, and we have a totally separate runtime for everything else. It's easily integratable into each other. And that's really significant for a number of reasons. First of all, it means communicating with, between the two is a lot easier. Um, and secondly, it means that there's uh, a lot less to like, download inside your web browser. Um, and like, third, for the people who are implementing browsers, like, I don't want all the hard work that's being done to optimize V8 and SpiderMonkey to have to be redone on a totally separate virtual machine too, right? Like, we want to have that work be done once and happen with everything that happens in the browser. Um, so that was really significant. Another one is that it's, WebAssembly is not tied to a particular language implementation. It's more agnostic. So Java applets, like the Java language and its instruction set architecture, was very heavily designed to support Java, the language. And for a long time, you could write other languages that would compile to Java, but they weren't very good. So for example, I come from the Ruby world, and we had JRuby. Um, and for a long time, like, it had to sort of emulate type system shenanigans until the JVM got this thing called Invoke Dynamic, and I won't go into that for a whole long time, but like, because Java was a statically typed language, the JVM had poor support for dynamically typed languages for a while. And that's because of this sort of narrow vision of we're here primarily to support Java and only incidentally to support other things, whereas WebAssembly is inherently thinking from the start about being language agnostic, which is important. And the final one is proper platform integration. Um, WebAssembly is actually reasonably tied into the whole rest of the web platform. Not super great yet, but we're getting there. There's some proposals for some details that I don't have time to talk about. But like, if you were writing a Java applet or, say, a Flash program, you basically get like what today we would think of as a canvas element that you would draw into, and it's totally separate from the rest of the world. So like, if you want to write your program mostly as a Java applet, you have to reinvent windowing, and you have to reinvent like, the event loop, and like, all this stuff 
Um, and that means you lose like accessibility features that are built into the web natively. And so it was kind of these previous attempts were sort of building their own universe within the web browser. And so us web people kind of rejected them. Like that's why we didn't like using these technologies. I was so excited when Apple finally killed Flash. Not because Flash is even bad. Flash is actually really good in a lot of ways. But like it wasn't really part of the web. It felt like Adobe trying to proprietorize. It's not a real word, but I may say it anyway. Uh, the existing like web. And so WebAssembly succeeded on all these fronts. One thing I didn't have room for to put on the bullets, because I don't want to make them too small um, as well, is that uh, WebAssembly also succeeded because it started small. If we wanted to standardize, say, the JVM, and this is part of the downfall of PC NACL, is that um, we would have had to standardize this massive language with this huge semantics. And so WebAssembly is intentionally very tiny. You basically get numbers and math. Um, at the moment. But that tininess is what allowed Apple, Google, Microsoft, Mozilla um, to all agree. I almost said Facebook there, which is wrong, but also a little, whew, um, uh, to all come together and agree on this spec. Like, we could get all these big companies to agree on 165 pages, but to agree on like a full, super big language spec is like much, much, much harder. Like, it's good that we barely can get everyone to agree on JavaScript, right? Like, that, we don't need a whole nother separate super, super huge spec. And that's also why WebAssembly has succeeded, is because it started modestly. OK, and so while I'm talking about WebAssembly as this instruction set that fills in, there's also stuff going on in the runtime, too, to help the web move forward. And so these are APIs that are accessible from JavaScript today, but sort of this idea of expanding the platform that WebAssembly fits into, these other things fit into it as well. So one of them that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is WebGL. Like, you get OpenGL in a web browser. And that's, like, really awesome, because um, you can do all sorts of 3D game stuff that you could never do before. Like, I remember when I was a little kid and I downloaded the demo of Doom off of a BBS and I played it on a computer, uh, and I was like, this is amazing. Um, and now you can like, do that in a web browser, and that's, that's really neat. Um, web audio is another great example of this. Like, you used to not be able to do microphone stuff on the web, and now you can, and playback, and like, all this you know, high resolution stuff. Like, I don't have a separate, I used to have a separate music player on my computer, and now I just use SoundCloud. And that's like, because of these APIs that have enabled us to do more rich things with multimedia on the web. And finally, my favorite example of a standard that's not there yet is web USB. Um, <laughs> So like, this spec lets you plug a USB stick in your computer and then read it from a web browser, which is like, what? <laughs> um, but like, if you think about like, when you use technologies like WebGL and Web Audio to build, say, like, a Photoshop inside the browser, you need to be able to save those files somewhere. And so why make the user download those files into the downloads folder and then copy them over onto a USB stick when you could just save them directly onto a USB thing anyway? That's a thing normal programs are able to do, and the web was not. And so that's like hindered the web's development. I don't actually know if WebUSB is going to make it or not. I haven't looked into it in a while. But it's sort of like the idea that we have all these other abilities that you could do in a web browser that you couldn't before. And I'm interested in making this list like way longer. Um, and so basically, I want you to be able to th imagine a future in which a web application does not inherently mean networked program running on the server um, or like a web page. Like, I want you to think about the web as a real, full, rich development environment, just as real and full and rich as native platforms like, actually are. Because we love the web, so why not make it better to build a whole bunch of stuff? Like, I don't want to have to like, drop down into native. Like, we had a whole talk about Electron yesterday, and like, one of the reasons Electron has been successful is because developing GUIs and native platforms is like, kind of terrible. I work on a native language. We don't really have good GUI support, and that's because it's really hard and bad. Um, <laughs> And so we'd rather like, install several different instances of Chrome to use every single messaging app that uses uh, you know, and like, uh, you know, Visual Studio Code and all these other programs that use an Electron-like environment. Because we love the web so much, we want multiple copies of it running on our computer. <laughs> OK, so I want to go back to, um, while I'm talking about this whole renaissance of the platform and developing the platform, um, I admit that this focus, like many of you have been doing JavaScript a lot, and so I come from sort of more of the back-end world, and so I'm talking about this in a more back-end oriented way. But many of you may be like, hey, Steve, we've been doing fancier stuff in JavaScript for a little while now. So I want to talk about this whole like JavaScript renaissance or rediscovery, as I like to put it. Um, you know, when we, like JavaScript is sort of like forgotten 
as like, oh yeah, you can like do really tiny things with an alert box, and that's cool, but that's not like a real programming language. And then at some point, we're like, wait, this is a real programming language, and I can do real things with it. And that led to this explosion of uh, you know, various different things. And one of those was, remember we were all talking about single page apps a long time ago? Um, I know that's not like the cool terms these days, but when we did that whole like single page app movement, one of the things that changed in the ways that applications were developed is that previously, you know, that slide I had before about the browser as a window into an environment running on the server, all the computation used to be done on the server. And part of the reason for that was that our computers sort of sucked and servers were like really big and expensive and like were more powerful. So you wanted the computation to happen there. But as our computers got more powerful, and people wanted to stop paying so much for servers and make you run the bills instead of them. That's a whole separate thing. Uh, we developed thick client applications that did a lot of the computation locally on your computer instead. And so a lot of that processing is now being done in your browser rather than on the server. And so um, this sort of shift that I'm talking about, especially with the offline stuff, is like, what if the whole application was running in your browser, but like entirely locally? Like, what if your web browser could not communicate with the internet? What stuff could you build? And I think that we could build a lot of really interesting and useful things. Um, and I'm focusing a lot on the offline thing, but there's some other big ideas I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but that's sort of like where I think a lot of this is going. Um, so. This is like, I wrote this slide like three months ago, but it's almost a direct callback to the end of the Electron talk from earlier. Like, why would you want to have a web browser that can't talk to the internet or that does USB stuff or whatever? And that's because one of the greatest strengths of the web is you get universal cross-platform applications effectively for free. And like, back in the IE6 days, that was not so much for free, but like, everybody's basically good on the standards front these, <laughs> these days for the most part. Um, so it's like much closer to for free than historically speaking. And like the no install necessary, I think, is a really big part of it. Like I don't want to download and install yet another app. I want to go to a URL and use it from within my web browser. Like I would love if I could just play all my games, like if Steam, like Steam already is basically a browser anyway, but like beyond that, like why doesn't Steam just run in my browser and my games run in my browser and my text editor runs in my browser and my shell runs in my browser and like I don't want to have to install things anymore. It's a lot of work. OK. I talked a bunch about WebAssembly, but I didn't actually talk about what it like, is. <laughs> and many of you may not know what it is, because uh, a lot of people don't. And I think that's actually sort of a tragedy of WebAssembly, is that I think that our marketing is pretty bad, honestly. I've been working on it a little bit. But I think WebAssembly is extremely misunderstood. I already talked about the people who think that WebAssembly is going to kill JavaScript and how they're sort of wrong. Um, but WebAssembly is also kind of misunderstood in other ways. So let's talk about what it actually is. Fundamentally, WebAssembly is a compact binary format for running programs on the web and other places. Asterisk. Um, here's an example of a factorial program in WebAssembly. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. It's like 30 bytes or something. This is actually shorter than even the source code of the JavaScript to write the factorial function. Um, but you don't want to write that by yourself, right? This is why the tools matter. Because if you had to write this by hand, that would be terrible. Um, so it also has a text format so that you can view source things. So a lot of people are concerned when they hear binary format. They're like, whoa, buddy, I learned a program by view sourcing JavaScript. And kids need to do that these days. And I'm like, have you tried to view source on any real web page these days? Like, that's sort of gone with all our minifiers and tree shaking and dead code elimination, which for some reason is called something different on the web. Um, whatever. Uh, but you can actually turn that binary format back into the original thing. So here's the text version of that binary code. And you may notice a lot of parentheses. I've got any Lisp fans around. Uh, we secretly snuck Lisp back onto the web again. Um, but even this is like, it's an assembly language. It's pretty low level. And so most of the time, you will be writing a different programming language and compiling it to WebAssembly. So you're not actually dealing with a low level format yourself. And uh, you know, source maps and debugging are an important part of this. And like, we have some of the precursors of that from the whole compile to JavaScript, because you know, even your JavaScript is compiled to other JavaScript before it's compiled to like, native code. So you know, we kind of have a handle on these problems, but it's still being worked on. Um, but fundamentally, you'll still be able to view source, which is really, really important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's designed to be very small and very efficient and integrate with existing JavaScript virtual machines. So, one interesting thing about WebAssembly is that it's designed for speed, 
But because it's so new, that speed is very variable. <laughs> Sometimes it's not actually very fast, but it's designed in a way that it will be fast whenever we put a bunch more work into it. And sometimes it's still very fast today. Like uh, in Spider Monkey, we recently like dropped the cost of calling back and forth between JavaScript and WebAssembly by like it's like three times as fast now or something. And it's because somebody just spent in it a couple days or a week and like sorted it out. So um, it's it will be super fast. Right now it's a little little sketchy. Um, I said it a bunch of times, but I'll say it again. WebAssembly is not supposed to replace JavaScript. And the people who tell you that are wrong, and they're bad. Um, <laughs> the, we need both one and two. We need the low-level and high-level parts of the platform. JavaScript is always going to be important to the web. And there's definitely one reason why it will definitely be a killer if you want to like, shut down this argument to people. Um, you already have the JavaScript virtual machine installed in your browser. But you know, I love Ruby, so let's say I want to compile Ruby to WebAssembly, and I want to have that on my web page. The problem is, is the Ruby interpreter is not actually inside your browser. So when I write my hello world in Ruby, it has to also compile the entire Ruby virtual machine to WebAssembly as well, and then ship that whole thing to the end user. So you're talking like multiple megabytes of space, whereas JavaScript, you don't need that. The virtual machine already exists. So if you're doing certain high-level tasks, like JavaScript will always be a, like a better and faster choice, even based on just purely the binary size argument. Um, and there's some things coming that will make that get a little different, but like, that's one example of why JavaScript will always be a special thing um, to the web and really important. So one of the big things that is a limitation of WebAssembly is that today it cannot access the DOM. And by that, I have to put a little asterisk on that statement. So WebAssembly does not have native access to the DOM, but WebAssembly can call into JavaScript. So what you do is you write a JavaScript function that calls in the DOM for you, and then you call it. Um, so you can manipulate the DOM with WebAssembly, but like doing that requires some manual work or a library, and it's also slow because you're crossing over the JavaScript to WASM boundary. As I just mentioned, that's getting a little faster, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in the future, um, WebAssembly will be able to access the DOM and the other platform features natively. But for right now, um, this is one limitation of WebAssembly, and there's definitely some others too, but I don't have time to get into those at the moment. Um, oh, wait, I have time for one more. <laughs> uh, I sort of covered this slightly with the whole Ruby thing, but one big thing that WebAssembly does not have is a garbage collector. And so that means that like, if you use a programming language that's garbage collected, then you need to compile a garbage collector to WebAssembly as well and have it do its thing. And so that means that like, functionally today, uh, you have C, C++, and this little programming language called Rust. Um, I won't talk about Rust a whole bunch more. Um, these three languages are also lean and mean and don't have big run times, and so they produce the smallest WebAssembly binaries and so are kind of often the big choices today. Um, any GC language is just inherently going to produce a lot more WebAssembly than non-GC languages. And uh, in the future, there will be a way to sort of ask the JavaScript GC to manage the lifetime of your objects, which will cut down on those languages. So if you have a GC language, you could integrate it with the JavaScript GC. But that's a whole big, long topic. So this is going to come eventually, but probably in the next like, couple of years time frame, I think. Um, we'll see. Predicting the future is hard. And then finally, another thing that's a big misconception that people don't understand is that JavaScript does not compile to WebAssembly. <laughs> uh, you have assembly script, which is like a TypeScript variant that does. But JavaScript itself like, doesn't compile to WASM. They're separate things. Um, and a lot of people get that confused, too. There's like no reason to. You already have the native environment installed. Like, Why would you? compile it to something else just to redo it again. It doesn't make sense. OK, you can do some cool stuff with WebAssembly. These next couple slides have cool stuff on them. You probably can't read this code, and it's fine because it's Rust code, so you can't read it anyway. But um, <laughs> this is somebody who wrote isomorphic Rust. So this is an async await, like a little networked server that makes network requests. And they wrote a library that lets them compile that Rust to WebAssembly. And uh, so the web requests turn into uh, Ajax requests on the like, client side, and on the server side, they're just regular old network requests. So there's like all sorts of fun stuff like that, um, and a whole bunch of other uh, stuff. You notice this guy has a Legend of Zelda uh, avatar. If you like video games, like this guy does all sorts of really ridiculous, absurd stuff. He's involved in like the speed running and like modding communities. Um, he wrote a <laughs> He wrote a uh, WebAssembly to Rust compiler and then took a uh, Game Boy emulator that was written in TypeScript, converted it to AssemblyScript, 
compiled that assembly script version into WebAssembly, compiled that WebAssembly into Rust, and now there was a, originally a JavaScript Game Boy engine that's now a native application. Uh, so like, compilers, they're fun. Um, <laughs> Here's another cool little demo, um, an example of heavy computation. You can sort of extrapolate this to anything else that requires heavy computation. This is called the Buddha Brat. Um, this is sort of like uh, one of those generative images. So if you zoom in and out, um, it you know, infinitely like, draws pretty images. And uh, I sort of cut it off in the slide because I don't have space, but it vaguely looks like a Buddha. You can kind of see the hands and the head there. Um, and so this renders in your browser, and then you can click on it, and it'll zoom in and display the next level down and all that kind of stuff if you're into these sort of fractal things. Um, and it can do that at relative ease and speed thanks to WebAssembly. Um, and finally, this one's my favorite. This is like my dream future right here. Nebulet is this operating system that's being worked on right now. And WebAssembly is the native program format for the operating system. That means every program you run as a user can only be WebAssembly programs. It does not, it does not run like native. Like native to it is actually WebAssembly. Um, this is ridiculous and amazing. Uh, it's being worked on like actively right now, and the, the beginning stuff works, but obviously that's a big task, so it's going to take a little while. I don't necessarily think this means that we'll be using this forever, but the fact that this is possible is like real cool to me. <laughs> um, I'm like super into it. So you can sort of dream as big as you want. Um, and beyond that, I also want to say that like, traditional web applications will still always be a thing. Um, like, not every single web page needs to be a super fast, complicated WebAssembly contraption. Like, there will still always be room for more simple applications. Like, honestly, when I build websites, I don't write that much JavaScript. I'm actually pretty bad at JavaScript. Um, but uh, you know, like, I still like it anyway. Um, but the point is, is that like, this is about expansion, not replacement. So we don't want to be able to throw out all the way that we write web apps today. This is about augmenting it to make it better. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're doing with WebAssembly in the Rust world is working heavily to make sure that you can use NPM packages that are entirely built in WebAssembly. Um, so you don't even need to know as a JavaScript developer that it's implemented in WASM. So I think over the next couple of years, a lot of you are going to start using WebAssembly, but you're not going to know it because it's going to be a dependency of your dependency of your dependency of your dependency's dependency is going to be in WebAssembly, and you're just not even going to notice. Um, so I think that for library authors, this is like a really interesting thing. But I'm sort of <clears throat> there's a lot of people who are like, cool, like Qt, the like Linux. Not only Linux, but like Linux native windowing platform now compiles to WASM so you can run Qt in your browser, sort of. Um, and so people are like, oh my god, I can just do that forever. I don't think that's going to be a real thing. I think that most of the time it's going to be mostly in JavaScript with little bits of WebAssembly. Um, Dropbox is doing a thing now where they have a WebAssembly compression algorithm. And so when you upload a file to Dropbox, they can compress it on the com client and then send it to the browser. And to save on bandwidth costs is like a great example of how this works. Their whole website is mostly in JavaScript, but this little compression bit is in WASM. Um, OK, I'm almost done wrapping up with talking about this future stuff. If you want to see like, some real crazy stuff, uh, there's this talk by Gary Bernhardt in 2014. Gary is an amazing presenter. If you've never seen him talk, um, he does a fantastic job. I was lucky enough to see this talk live, and it's called The Birth and Death of JavaScript. And uh, it's about how JavaScript will never actually die. Like, it will just permanently be in existence. He wrote this before WebAssembly existed, and he calls it metal. Um, but if you watch it today, knowing that WASM exists, this might get some of your creative juices flowing with like, the possibility of what we're able to do with the web. I'll give you a short spoiler. So this talk is set in a mythical future, 40 years in the future, and it's about the history of the last 60 years of JavaScript. Um, <laughs> And uh, what he does is he has this demo where he uh, compiles a shell to the browser via what is now WebAssembly, and then compiles the compiler to the browser via WebAssembly. Note, this already exists. You can actually run Clang in your browser today, um, incidentally. Uh, and then you can compile your shell in the browser via the compiler that you just compiled in your browser. So now you're compiling all your programs inside your browser and using them from in your browser. Um, this is the universe I want. Uh, I'm trying to tell as many people as possible because I want everyone else to build it. Like, one person cannot make this happen, but uh, it's, it's cool. Um, okay, 
This is my big takeaway slide. As I said earlier, I think this is about like the future of the web. I want you to all think about the web as something that is not traditionally what we think about web applications and like reach for the sky. Because we all love the web and we want to be able to work with the web. So let's make the web do non-webby stuff so that we can keep you know, using these awesome technologies that we love. Thank you so much. That is all I have for you today.